Uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, so yeah, the purpose of today's lunch session is essentially just to give you a, 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 an overview of the recent uh, R&D tax credit changes uh, that's been announced by the government that are going to be coming into force um, very soon, just to give you guys a heads up on what's changing and also obviously to make you aware so that you can make necessary plans um, if it's going to impact you or not. So uh, my name is Matthew Jones. Um, so a little bit about myself um, and my background. So I'm the managing director of, uh, of a company called Limestone Grey. Um, so we're a specialist R&D tax credit consultancy based in Wales. Um, and we only do R&D tax credits. We don't do anything else. So um, I myself am a dual qualified chartered accountant and a chartered tax advisor. Um, and I've been doing R&D tax credits for probably 10 plus years now, um, working with both large companies and SMEs um, from Wales and, and, and beyond um, in order to claim R&D tax credits under both the uh, large company scheme, RDEC, or and the SME tax relief as well. So to jump in, um, so the purpose of today is, um, like I said, just to go through the recent changes. It's not to go through what are R&D tax credits or the eligibility criteria. Um, if you want to discuss that, um, just give me a shout at the end um, and I can talk you through that. Um, it is mainly focused on, on what's changing in, in the rules. But before, just to give you the really quick overview of what it is, um, uh, as you're probably all aware, it is a form of corporation tax relief. So it's just going to be available to companies. Um, it was created by the government in 2000, um, so it's quite old now, it's been around for a while, and it can provide qualifying companies with quite a sizable cash injection um, for their businesses. Um, as you can see at the bottom there, qualifying companies can claim up to 33 pence in every pound spent on qualifying R&D, so it is a very generous relief. So on to the reforms. So in March 21, uh, the government um, decided to launch a variety of consultations specifically focused on research and development tax credits and innovation in the UK. So it was kind of looking at two, uh, two areas, really, the way in which companies um, are utilising R&D tax credits or, or, or not, as the case may be, um, and the applicability of the current R&D tax credit scheme to modern R&D practices by, by businesses. So... As a result of these consultations, um, the Chancellor has announced some reforms in the 2021 autumn budget statement, um, so which are going to be coming into effect, an effective period starting on or after the 1st of April uh, 2023. So to go through what these are. So essentially from the 1st of April 2023, a number of measures will be introduced and they're going to tackle three different areas so firstly uh it's going to be looking at fraudulent activity and abuse of the scheme so um essentially what uh, has been picked up with through the consultations is that there is a significant abuse of r d tax relief um by some companies in the uk and some advisors as well um so it's looking to tackle those um another area is looking to do oh, Tackle is refocusing the innovation here in the UK rather than funding innovation taking place abroad. Um, and also it's looking at extending the eligible cost categories um, just to make the relief more fit for modern, modern R&D practices. Um, so these measures will affect the way in which companies make an R&D tax credit claim and the costs that you can include in that claim. So first area is tackling fraudulent activity and abuse of the scheme. So there's a concern amongst the government and also amongst industry partners and R&D consultancies over abuse of the scheme and boundary pushing um, by unregulated and unscrupulous R&D agencies um, and for companies taking advantage of payable tax credits. So um, R&D tax relief, and the advice is a unregulated industry. Um, there's no regulation on anyone who can provide advice to a claimant company, which surprises some people. 
Um, and what they found is essentially lots of these companies pop up. Um, they use aggressive marketing techniques to try and uh, capture companies to make large claims and tell them essentially that they can claim for activities that they probably shouldn't be um, and getting them passed through HMRC and getting a huge uh, fee off the back of that. Essentially, why these do pass through HMRC, HMRC can only tackle a small proportion of claims that get submitted. A large proportion will go through unchecked. Um, and that's what they rely on. So they're looking at ways of tackling these companies. Um, and also companies taking advantage of payable tax credits. So I've seen this myself in, in, um, in practice. So uh, companies be informed, uh, fraudulent fake companies, um, preparing a set of accounts with fictitious expenditure included in that, um, and then claiming R&D tax relief on that expenditure. So um, we've seen companies try to attempt that. Obviously, we've never submitted a claim on, on that, but we've seen that ourselves um, over the years as well. So um, they're looking to tackle that. Um, so as you, see, as you can see there, evidence shown that this abuse of R&D tax credits has grown in recent years, and the uh, government estimate that both error and fraud across both schemes, the SME scheme and the large company artist scheme, equates to up to uh, around £311 million. Um, so it is quite a significant um, problem that they're trying to deal with. So there are already measures in place um, to try and fight the emergence of fraudulent activity. So last year, HMRC took on an additional 100 um, inspectors specifically to tackle R&D tax relief claims. Um, as I said previously, um, typically it's been the case that only a small proportion of R&D claims are checked by HMRC because they just don't have the resources to look at each and every one. So they're looking to take on additional resources so that that proportion of all claims checked um, uh, increases so that they capture any, any uh, fraudulent claims. And also from April 21, so that's in effect um, a PAYE cap came in. Um, so for essentially these companies that tend to um, set up fraudulent companies, put some expenditure in, tend to rely on subcontractor expenditure um, so that the PAYE cap uh, has come in to essentially uh, restrict the payable tax credit that they can receive to £20,000 plus three times the PAYE MI liability of that company. So that's actually in effect. So if you've got these companies putting in hundreds of, or millions of pounds of fake um, subcontractor expenditure, they have no one working on the payroll. Um, it's essentially designed to limit the potential exposure of HMRC to, to these, these sort of fraudulent company claims. Um, that, that said, these, these have been in place now um, for a little while, but they're still um, picking up a lot of significant problems with, with claims. So they're looking to essentially um, bring in additional regulation changes to try and, and crack down on this. So the changes um, that come into force, um, so all businesses that look to claim R&D tax credits will have to um, follow these uh, points that are, are coming in, into place. So, um, so firstly, all R&D tax credit claims going forward will need to be submitted digitally to HMRC. Now, us as a consultancy, we don't submit any claims that aren't digital, um, but some consultancies out there are still preparing paper submissions and, and putting them in. So. Um, they're going to be made digitally, which allows HMRC to um, more scrutiny over the information that's being submitted when it's submitted digitally. So that's going to be coming into effect from 1st of April 23 onwards. Accounting period starting on or after 1st of April 23, all R&D claims submitted digitally. Um, and a big point there, digital claims will in future require much more technical detail, both on the actual R&D projects that are being claimed, um, so they're going to want to understand what, what makes that project qualify for you to submit an R&D tax credit claim, but also information on the specific expenses that are being included in the claim. So as it stands at the moment, the boxes on a, on a tax return form for R&D just ask for the total R&D spend. It doesn't ask for a breakdown of those, but um, they're going to want that breakdown between the relevant categories of expenditure. 
Um, and here's probably the, the main points that they're go going to do to try and tackle these uh, abuse issues. Each claim will be endorsed by a named senior officer of the company. So from now on, from sorry, from 1st of April 23 onwards, um, when you submit an r and claim, a named representative from the company needs to put their, well, essentially put their name to that claim that they, they're happy with it and that, that they stand behind it. Um, a lot of what we've heard, at least, is a lot of companies who make R&D tax relief claims using advisors sometimes never actually see the claim that goes in, um, in their name. Um, but going forward, the company needs to put their name behind it, so they're going to want to make sure that they see everything that's been put in in, in their name. Um, another point, this is a, a big one, an important one. Companies will need to inform HMRC in advance uh, of their intention to make an R&D tax relief claim. So this is a requirement that will come into play from for a company to start 1st of April 23 onwards, that if you're new to R&D tax credits, or if you have not made a claim within the last three years, you need to tell HMRC that you plan to make a claim within six months of the end of the accounting period that you're going to be claiming for. So this is a big change. Um, in our view, it's a very negative change um, because what's going to happen is that it's going to prevent companies that become aware of the fact that they qualify for R&D tax relief going back um, to, to make claims for past periods. Um, as it stands at the moment, any company can make an R&D tax relief claim provided they are within what's called the amendment window. So the amendment period for amending their corporation tax return. That amendment window is two years from the end of your accounting period in which to amend the, the, the return. Um, going forward then, if um, a company hadn't made this electronic declaration, even if they're within that amendment period, they're not going to be able to make a claim. So it's a big, big um, change that's been made. So um, companies going forward, um, even if they're not sure, they are going to be making a claim for a specific period, um, they're going to need to just make that electronic declaration just in case, just to keep their options open. Um, so that's important that you make a note of that. If you haven't claimed in the past three years, um, or this will be your first claim, or the uh, going forward, you'll need to make that declaration online to HMRC that you intend to submit an R&D claim. Um, and also to deal with the unscrupulous agencies, claims will need to include details of any agent uh, that advised the company on compiling the claim. So what HMRC found is essentially some of these consultancies were preparing R&D reports and calculations and passing them back to the company for the, them to then provide them to their accountant for submission. So essentially they're hiding behind their accountants. Um, so going forward, they're going to want to know the name of that consultancy that provided you advice. Obviously, if HMRC then pick up that that consultancy is not pre preparing correct claims, then they can do a filter and find out all the claims that that consultant um, advised on. So that's going to be a big, big change as well. Um, at the bottom, you know, I note that some of these changes are very welcome. I think um, submitting claims digitally and providing uh, additional information is welcome. It's the way we've always prepared claims. We've always submitted them digitally. We've always prepared detailed project reports, um, provided detailed breakdowns of the expenses that are included in the claim. So for us, it's not really going to change anything. Um, but for some consultancies that don't do that, then obviously um, it's going to have an impact on them, which, which is a good thing because it's going to prevent them from, from um, any sort of abuse. The bad thing um, mentioned there will create a lot of red tape and penalise companies claiming for the first time and that's that notification to HMRC within six months of the end of that accounting period. I think that's quite a negative impact because if seven months after the year end, a company discovers that they, they're eligible for R&D tax credits, I think, you know, if the activity qualifies, they should be able to claim. But um, unfortunately, it's not going to be the case. Uh, apologies for the noise. There's some uh, workmen next door. Uh, apologies for that. Um, so those are the changes that are coming into effect. Um, another 
uh, change that's coming into place is uh, they're looking to refocus innovation in the UK. So currently, uh, the following rules uh, applying to subcontractors and externally provided workers are under the SMA relief, companies are able to claim for some direct costs of research and development activities, so your wages, your consumable materials, um, and also within the eligible categories of expenditure, they can claim for subcontracted R&D activities in general. So what in general meaning, you know, to a limited company, to a university, to a charity, it doesn't matter who you've subcontracted it to, you're able to claim it under the SME relief. Um, the current rules for the RDEC relief, which is a large company scheme, so you're able to claim some direct costs of, of your R&D, such as your, as your wages and your materials as before, um, but you were restricted anyway with subcontracted R&D activities as they had to be subcontracted to a qualifying body such as university or charity they couldn't use say a limited company subcontractor in, a, in a, a, an RDEC claim anyway um, and under the RDEC um, large companies were also able to claim for independent contributions to research of a charity or university so they could get tax relief on that so that's the current situation as it stands um, but the government has confirmed um, that essentially they're looking to refocus R&D tax relief towards innovation taking place in the UK. So what they're going to be doing uh, is essentially restricting the options for subcontracted R&D. So, um, so where companies subcontract R&D tasks to a third party, such as testing or fabrication, um, in future, they will only be able to claim relief for expenditure where the third party performs the work in the UK. So you guys, the UK subcontractor. Uh, it's going to apply to uh, SME scheme and RDEX scheme. So um, if you're using subcontractors abroad, um, unfortunately, for a period starting on or after 1st of April 23, you will no longer be able to include those costs within your claim. Um, and the same goes for uh, the externally provided worker costs that you're able to currently claim for. Um, so under both schemes, uh, where companies incur expenditure on payments for externally provided workers, uh, they'll only be able to claim relief on such expenditure where those workers are paid through a UK payroll. Um, so unfortunately, if your externally provided workers are, are abroad, um, then you're not going to be able to include them going forward. Um, so there are going to be some exemptions to the proposed changes. So um, obviously the cost of software, if that comes from overseas, that's, that's not affected. Um, clinical trial volunteers abroad, again, not affected. Um, data cloud sourced uh, abroad, again, not, not affected. And there is a, uh, also an exemption for where the subcontracting tasks cannot realistically be, be performed within the UK. Um, and no, these are only extreme exceptions. So for argument's sake, if your R&D was related to deep sea research, obviously you're not going to be able to do that in the UK. Um, devices for measuring volcano eruptions, obviously, you know, the UK doesn't have any volcanoes, so you're going to have to use some um, people abroad. So it's only a very extreme examples you're going to be able to include overseas subcontractors. Um, unfortunately, um, if your argument is we got to use um, overseas subcontractors because I can't find the necessary skills in the UK, or it's a lot cheaper to use someone abroad, that's not going to cut it. They're not going to allow that exemption. So um, as noted above, companies use subcontractors overseas for a lot of reasons, um, mainly because you know the specialized talent just isn't here in the UK. It's a lot cheaper often. Um, you know, we do claims for companies very software-based in particular, they use a lot of um, Sri Lankan or Indian developers. Um, they're not going to be able to use or include them in, in their R&D tax relief claim. And you may have a long-standing relationship with a particular subcontractor abroad, but um, going forward, they're not going to be claimable. Um, so these measures essentially mean that you as claimant companies are going to have to make a decision. Do you, do you maintain that overseas subcontractor and not include that cost in your R&D claim? Or do you source a subcontractor UK-based um, so that you can include them in, in your claim? And it's just going to be a case of looking at the cost versus benefit on that and making that decision. Um, and another change coming into place is expansion of the cost categories. So we've got a, a removal in reality of cost categories with that 
restriction on subcontractors and external provided work as they're taking away overseas um, entities from being included. Um, but there's also going to be an expansion of, of the cost categories. So from the 1st of April 23, uh, companies will be able to include data and cloud computing costs. So that's the big change. So it's going to be license payments for data sets. So um, as you're probably all aware, data sets are a vital R&D tool for companies across many sectors, uh, but particularly those in high-tech computational-based companies. Um, so license payments for such will therefore qualify as spend so long as the data set is not resold um, afterwards. So you can't then sell it on. And also the data set needs to have no lasting value within the company beyond the R&D project. So if you're going to use it um, for other purposes ongoing to benefit your business, it's not an R&D expense then. So it's just got to be not resold and have no lasting value um, to, to the business to ensure that the company only claims for costs incurred solely for the R&D project. Um, also cloud computing and software. Um, is going to be included in, in, in this. So where research is data intensive, uh, you know, companies rely on third-party processing capacity and analytical tools to interrogate data uh, with businesses accessing these capabilities via the internet or the cloud. Um, this is typically the most effective way of performing this activity. And in some instances, the only viable way to achieve you know, the project's uh, outcome. Um, so these additional cost categories are coming into play, which is great news. Um, now, at the moment, with regards to software uh, costs, you weren't ever, ever able to claim cloud-hosted software. So for software to be claimable, it had to be downloadable and installable onto a local device. Um, so you wouldn't be able to claim for software where you know, you log in through a web browser, so it's, it's a cloud application. Um, but going forward, that's going to be added in. So that's going to be, you know, a, a great advantage because a lot of people use software of that of that sort. Um, so it's, it's kind of moving it forward with the times. So these changes, obviously, are looking to encourage greater R&D spend, but also reflect um, modern day research and development techniques. Um, license payments to date sets and cloud computing um, on software. Um, these are things that are large expenses for a lot of companies these days undertaking R&D activities and to date haven't been claimable. So this is a, a, you know, a really welcome, welcome change uh, to the relief. Um, so what next? So the above changes that we just discussed will come into effect for county peers starting on or after 1st of April 23. So they're not going to impact you now. They might not impact you on your next accounting period, but then they start to come into play. So these changes will affect most companies that carry out R&D. Um, so you need to make some considerations now um, in order to best place your business for future R&D tax credit claims when they do come into effect. Now, these aren't all the changes. So we were expecting further changes to be announced in October. Obviously, the recent change in the Prime Minister um, and Rishi Sunak not being Chancellor may impact that now. Um, but that was the original plan and may still be the case that we see some further uh, changes coming in into play in October. Um, so be mindful that there might be some, some further in changes being made. So it is important that you currently, uh, if you are claiming uh, under either the R&D scheme, you need to plan um, or plan to claim in the near future. You need to seek advice from a regulated and qualified professional. So if you're using your accountant, that should be fine. If you're using you know, a, a regulated entity, you know, you're going to be getting sound advice. Um, but if, if you are um, got any doubts um, it's important that you seek advice from, from uh, a regulated consultancy just to make sure that you're in, in a good place to go forward um, it's essential that you understand the changes and how they're going to impact your business going forward um, and need to plan now uh, to ensure you don't miss out on any potential benefits um, uh, for your business so that's essentially it. Those are the changes that are, that are coming in, or, or at least those are the ones that we're currently aware of. Like I said, there might be some further changes coming into play in, in October, later in, in the year. Um, but yeah, so it's important that you guys um, 
essentially look at that if you're claiming at the moment is it going to affect you or not um if it is then come and have a chat and we can see what we can do um you know to minimize any negative impact or also perhaps take advantage of some of the changes as well maybe that might um, benefit your company by you know allowing additional expenditure in, into your claim um so yeah that, that covers that um a little bit about limestone gray so if you want to come and have a chat with us we offer free free um consultations so um feel free to give us you know uh, a, get in touch and we can chat through your particular uh, situation so um as i mentioned previously so we're regulated consultancy there's only a handful of us out there so we're regulated by the chartered institute of tax um which is the main tax body in the uk um so as we know i noted earlier we only do r d tax credits um we do a lot of them so we're able to understand um the changes in legislation and how they impact businesses um we've always done claims digitally we've always prepared them with detailed breakdowns and it, so it's not going to be a major impact to our clients but if if you haven't prepared them in that way um then you know, it's going to be a big impact to you guys to change the way you're, you're doing your claims. Um, and there's no lengthy contracts um, that we tie clients into. And we're happy to give some free advice um, if you need to chat through your situation as well. Um, and yeah, that's it. So essentially, hopefully you found that useful um, and that if it is going to impact your business, you know, you can take action now um, just so that, you know, any negative impact is mitigated to the best best it can be. Lisa? Thanks, Matthew. There was a lot of uh, info in there. Um, I haven't got anything in the chat, but if anybody wants to come off their um, mics and ask Matthew any questions while you've got him, now's the time to do it. But there's a lot of info in there, to be fair. Hi, Matthew. Thanks for all that. Hi. That's, That's really okay. interesting. Um, so a uh, so very quick thing about my situation. I, I've just uh, incorporated a, a couple of limited companies having been a a sole trader for a while um as i understand it there's no there's no way i can even though i've been doing a lot of r d um as a sole trader there's no way i can claim because i'm not wasn't a limited company so correct yeah i was just checking that that is your understanding it of it as well um it, yeah unfortunately um we see this a lot so um some individuals conduct a lot of r d as a sole trader or perhaps a, a, a partnership um spend a lot of money and then they look to incorporate after they've perhaps developed a minimum viable product just to exploit it through a limited company but unfortunately then the, you know the r d didn't take place within that separate legal entity of that limited company so unfortunately we can't bring that expenditure across yeah no that's fine um i understood that i mean that's kind of one of the main one of the main reasons why i've i've incorporated um so i guess the other thing is, uh, you know, I I know there's a few people operating in this in this marketplace. Um, you know, it, it seems clear that there's a bit of malpractice going on around here. So, you know, what yeah. what what do you? I don't. Know, you don't have to answer these questions, but what, what do you think I should be looking out for when I'm talking to potential people to work with? That's one question. Number yeah. two is, is it even possible to do it myself, or do I need to use an outside consultant? And then and, and number three, um, what's the kind of going rate? You know, I guess this is a competitive marketplace, but what kind of percentage are, are people generally taking as a, as a, as for, for kind of helping you with this? You don't okay. have to answer all of them. I'm just, you know, it's my style it's, just yeah. to get everything out there. That's all right. Um, so, the, so the first one was what, what to ask for. And I, 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 the main thing is their qualifications and experience. So, they need to be a qualified tax professional. So there's certain qualifications. CTA is, stands for Chartered Tax Advisor, which is the highest qualification for a tax professional in, in the UK. But, you know, a, a chartered accountant will have a good knowledge as well. So if they're ACA, ACCA qualified, they should have a good detailed knowledge of that. Secondly, is their company a regulated entity? And but who by? Um, so there was a company, um, that I can't, I'm not going to name names, but they set up and branded themselves as regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, which was on the bottom of their website. Now, Financial Conduct Authority has no bearing over tax advice, um, and they just done that in order to try and, you know, um, well, for, for 
obvious reasons why they've done that. So there's only a few entities that would be regulated. So there's the Institute of Chartered of Accountants in England and Wales, um, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, and the Chartered Institute of Tax. Those are the three entities that are, are going to be regulating this sort of this sort of industry. Or, um, so if you are regulated, you you have to abide by the professional code of conduct in ethics, which means that you should be obviously providing accurate, correct advice and not be pushing um, uh, claims or, or overinflating them. Um, so that'll give you comfort. Um, and also, you've got someone to complain to if, <laughs> if, if they did provide you with any sort of, of, of dodge, dodgy advice. But... You know, you just got to make sure that the person is qualified to provide the advice, experienced and regulated. Those are the three different things to look out for with an, with an R&D tax credit specialist. If yours has got that, great. You can have some comfort that they're going to be giving you, you know, the right advice. Um, the second question, sorry, it was... Is it possible to do yourself? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There's definitely not something you have to use an in a, in a, in a agency to do. Um Obviously, there are benefits, well, but the benefit of doing it yourself is you save any any sort of professional fees. Obviously, that and that can be of significant value. The benefits of using the consultancy is the fact that they're going to be uh, fully or should be fully up to date with the legislation, the rules, the experience on how what information is required, how it should be presented to give you the best probability of a successful outcome, and also know the rules around what costs can and can't be claimed or what rates uh, that need to be applied so that when it goes into HMRC is correct. Um, that is all something you can do yourself. Um, there is information on HMRC's website that you can follow to try, try and do that. If you have the time um, to do that, then then great, I, you know, it, it will save you a lot of, a lot, you know, the professional fees are on that. So yeah, definitely it's not something you have to have to use a consultancy for. And percent, the fee wise, um, typically the, the industry works on a contingent fee basis. So it's a percentage of the cash benefit that a, a company, um, uh, what a consultancy can achieve for, for a company. Now, typically I would say 20% is the going rate for a good consultancy. Anything more than that, you're paying ridiculous money through the nose. Um, anything less than that, then they got to give somewhere in terms of the quality of their service. So 20% is, is the standard. So if you were to shop around the regulated consultancies, I think you'll probably find that. Obviously, there's flexibility in that dependent on the size of your claim. So if your claim were to be large, then the scope for that percentage to then be reduced because obviously, you know, um, if the claim is that big, you don't want the fee to be that huge. Um, but yeah, that, that's the typical standard within the industry. Brilliant. Thank you for answering those questions. Much appreciated. That's okay. I've got a question. Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, just a quick one. You, you did say in the, in the presentation that you can't claim for um, cloud-based software. We, the, we've been claim, we have been claiming for, uh, for for the software, but we write the software. It's part of what we're. Uh, it's part of the. Yeah, you know, we're writing the software because our, yeah. our our product is actually in the cloud. So, but we yeah. write we write it all. I, I take it that that's not what you mean. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a distinction between the the costs of performing the R and D versus what you're doing. So, yeah. um, with regards to developing software, um, you know. Often you need to perhaps have some software tools installed on your computer to enable you to do to do that activity. So provided that is a downloadable and installable solution, then it, and is obviously used for R&D purposes, then all of it or a percentage thereof can be allocated to your R&D tax relief claim. The fact that you're developing a cloud-based solution is, is irrelevant. It's, it's just based on, on what you can claim for as the costs of doing that work. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. I, I thought I, I thought it must mean something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry that's if fine. I didn't make that clear. But, no, but no, yes. no, no, no. It's, it's, it's okay. That's that's fine. Thank, thank you very much for clearing that. No worries. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, I guess um, I think you said earlier, didn't you, that um, if if they get questions, are they okay to come to you? Yeah. Or so come my... through via us, but obviously you've got your either way. Address. 
yeah so my de- my details are up on on the screen now so um if anyone wants to take note of them um more than happy to deal with you know if you want to drop me an email or give me a call um to discuss through any specifics of your situation happy to happy to do so um yeah so uh, and also you've all got your um, relationship managers as well that you can go through as well yeah yeah if you need to um that i think that's it uh, you can go and get yourself a coffee now matthew thanks for that and, no worries. Um, Hopefully see some of you on our next webinars. I'm not sure we've got anything booked till October, but I'm sure they'll be popping some on before that. So keep an eye out for those. Any questions, queries, please get in touch with any of us or go through to Matthew if there's something that you think after the call that you wish you'd ask him, then uh, just drop him a line there. So thanks, everyone. Brilliant. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank thanks, thanks, Matthew. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.